The world is leverage long, okay? Long, meaning they own stuff, and they borrowed money to own it, and it's going down in value. In today's video, Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater Associates, discusses where we are in the changing world order, the macroeconomic outlook, and the rising tensions between the US and China. We've got banks collapsing, US dollars under attack, uh, looming recession. What is going on? How do we step back and think about this moment? I look at three major forces that are happening now, um, haven't happened in our lifetimes, um, but have happened many times in history. And those three major forces are the creation <clears throat> of a lot of debt and the printing of a lot of money to buy that debt, because, particularly because the government is running large deficits. And so they don't have enough money, so that government has to print that money. So that creation of all of that, that debt and its financial implications and its economic implications is one force. The second force is um, the internal conflict the amount of conflict that's internally largely due to the largest wealth gaps that we've had since the 30s. They, um, and that produces populism of the left and the right, particularly when there are financial difficulties. The third force um, is the rising uh, power, the um, challenging the existing power. Um, largely in the form of uh, China and to some extent Russia. Um, so well, let's call it the great power conflict because in 1945, you know, there's there's the cycle. You have a war and after a war, you have winners and the winners determine the rules of the game. And then there's this evolution of others becoming more competitive and then you have a conflict again. Um, for who's in control. So we have that dynamic taking place. So those three influences, the financial, the <clears throat> internal conflict, external conflict uh, influences are having a dominant um, influence. I learned before that when I was surprised, um, often it was because of things that hadn't happened in my lifetime before, but happened in history because of that reason. I went back and uh, studied history the, the last 500 years on these cycles. There are big cycles that last about 75 years, give or take about 50 years and, and uh, of rises and declines. And I put that out because I think it's so important people understand that I put it out in a book called The Changing World Order and in a free video called The Changing World Order. So when we look at each one of those, they're important. I also learned in studying history that there were two other influences that were very big and you could see them. Uh, the first was acts of nature, such as droughts, floods, and pandemics. The changes over time in uh, the evolution over time of people's learning and the technologies they make. So I'd say there are the really five big influences that drive everything, and they are the money and debt economic influence, the internal conflict, the external conflict, the nature uh, influence, um, and the let's call it the technology influence. So as we go now into this, uh, it's important. And um, when we get into whatever we're gonna talk about, it'll be certainly in the context of those things. And since they each affect each other, it produces what I call the big cycle. What happened with the SVB bank collapse? Was that something that you knew, okay, something like that is coming? Or was that a surprise to you? No. I, it, it was it was obvious. Um, look, um, if you, just let's. I, I want to talk about the mechanics. Really, I'm so eager to pass along an understanding of the mechanics, so people mm -hmm. themselves can do the mm -hmm. analysis. Um, so, 
one man's debts are another man's assets. Um, okay, so what happened? The government had to sell a lot of debt. And <clears throat> when it sold a lot of debt, there were a lot of entities that bought a lot of bonds, government bonds. Um, and money was very easy, which meant that short-term interest rates were very low. Um, and money was almost being, it was actually being given away because they had interest-only loans and interest rates were less than 1%. And you didn't have to pay back principal. So you could go get money and so that created um, a lot of debt and it created hmm, a lot of um, bu buying of government bonds. So what happened to um, Silicon Valley Bank um, is uh, what, happened to, what happened to many, many entities all around the world, not just banks. They, um, what, what does a bank do? A bank takes in deposits, typically, or debt in some way, and then it buys debt. It can do that in the form of making a loan, or it could do that in the form of buying a government bond, buying debt. And then, when interest rates went up, the value of that debt went down. The money they had to give to depositors became more and more expensive. And also depositors wanting them to be competitive looked at money market rates or other rates and withdrew money from the bank to because they had better uses. Okay, so what that, that leave them with, it's a banking problem that has happened literally for thousands of years, that, um, that what they do is the depositors, you know, want their money back and they're holding assets that are, in this case, have gone down in value, so they're broke. The, the investments that they've made have gone down in value. Now you get a perfect storm. Exactly, I think you said it very well. Um, you're allowed to be in the business. Let's call it one-tenth. It's actually less than one-tenth is your Whoa. money. Whoa. Uh, but let's call it one-tenth. You, um, you have a certain amount of money up. They give you the deposits. You invest the money within these general guidelines. So, for example, government bonds are safe from default. So you buy the government bonds. You think you're making a spread. And then what happens is the government bonds go down in value at the same time as the people say, hey, I want to go take my money and put it someplace else. So you don't have enough money. And central banking works like that, except the government can print the money. So the risk in, when it's a government is not that you won't get the money back unless, in, like in this particular case, for a bank, it goes down in value. So you ain't going to get that back. You're going to sell it. But anyway, you described it very well. You, what, what happens for the economy as a whole is then they print the money because they don't want defaults. There's a tolerable amount of defaults, and then you get past the tolerable amount of defaults and it just crushes everything. And so they print the money, okay. And so this thing with the bank is not a Silicon Valley bank is a loan issue. It's not a banking issue. It is a global issue in terms of all around the world, all sorts of entities, pension funds, um, um, insurance companies, um, all around the world. Uh, there was a lot of the buying of these government bonds, which have gone down in value. And if you then take it and you say, what's the value of those? Those have gone down. And the cost of money is high. And so the world is leverage long, okay? long, meaning they own stuff, and they borrowed money to own it, and it's going down in value. I think it's pretty easy to judge on a, um, you know, an intermediate or longer term basis, because there, there's a choice, right? 
Um, the, the, the predominant, the, the big issue is, you know, okay, the government can come in and print the money and give money to anybody they want to give money to. But when they do that, that typically devalues the money. So if, think about it, if you're holding a bond, you know, you got a claim on money. Um, but the claims are too much. So one way or another, you're either not going to get back that money in full, or you're going to um, get back money that's worth less because they print whoa, the money. Whoa. 